Okay, this is a happy birthday to Vijay. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is consciousness, and this is work I've been doing with uh, Lenore uh, for actually quite a long time. Uh, she and I teach a course on uh, computation and complexity, and we've wondered for a long time if we could somehow deal with these questions of consciousness. And uh, so what I'll try to present here is a model, uh, which is what I'm going to try to do uh, in my, our next class. So let me, to explain the problem, uh, let me talk about the easy and the hard problems. These are defined by David Chalmers, easy and hard. Easy is to make a machine that can simulate feelings of pain and joy, and hard is to make a machine that truly experiences feelings of pain and joy. And there is a difference. And uh, the difference becomes really evident when you consider a disorder called pain asymbolia. And there are two types, pain asymbolia one and two. And in pain asymbolia, the person knows about the pain. You can pinch or prick them, and they know about the pain. They know where they've been pinched. They know where they've been pricked. They know how hard. They know how painful. They know everything that you know about the pain, but they don't feel any agony. In pain asymbolia one, the girl who has it, uh, when she's pinched and pricked, she giggles because she knows how strange this is to people. In pain asymbolia two, the person doesn't giggle. You can see they're sweating, they cry out, but they don't feel any agony. They're kind of surprised themselves that their unconscious is apparently feeling the, uh, the agony, but they themselves are not. So this is very important because we, in a sense, know how to build robots that are pain asymbolic. We know how to make them so that they simulate having it, but what would you do with such a robot to make it actually feel? What would you do with the person whose pain is symbolic? What would you give it so it would actually feel the pain? OK, so the answer to this, I think, is going to come out of what the, uh, the neuro cognitive neuroscientists have agreed that uh, this and other questions about consciousness have to do with the architecture of the brain. So it's an architecture. Let me just say that uh, uh, it's an architecture that explains the brain at a very high level of abstraction, a level well above that of neurons. I'm not going to bring in neurons at all. It's a higher level. Uh, and that the model is coming from these cognitive neuroscientists. There's uh, agreement on this. The architecture is not obvious. It's got a name. It's called the global workspace model or the theater model. And uh, this, I say it's not obvious because for a long time, I wanted to understand how I could model, get a hold of consciousness. You know, uh, uh, Plato's no explanation of consciousness, his, his model of the brain was essentially a finite automaton. You, you know, all, you're born with the knowledge of all the languages in the world, and uh, the, you eventually reach a state where you're in the state where you know the particular language you're taught. This, this was Plato. You could think of Turing machines. I want an architecture that would help me to understand uh, consciousness. And uh, the extraordinary idea for it is due to this neuroscientist, Bernie Bars. There's a picture of him. And uh, there's one of his several books in the theater of consciousness, beautiful book. So I'm going to give you the intuition at a very high level now, Bars' theater of consciousness. Uh, so he describes conscious awareness through a theater analogy in which uh, there is a stage, as you see here, and you are conscious of, you are aware of the activity on that stage. You are not aware of anything else. You are not aware, you, you, see the, you can see the world. You are aware of what's there. The, 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 the audience is the unconscious processors, and you don't know how they work. Uh, so this is Barr's theater, um, and here, in fact, Barr's has a model of consciousness. This is his model. Uh, you can see the inputs coming in on the left, the outputs going out, off to the right. There's that central executive at the top, which is like the finite state part of a Turing machine. Uh, there's this working memory, uh, and then there's a lot of 
uh, long-term memory and special skills at the bottom. This is his model, it's not very formal. It's roughly, it's an informal. What I would like to do, what we, we would like to do, what Lenore and I are doing, is formalizing this model uh, that the neuroscientists have come up with, formalizing it and then coming up with definitions of consciousness and agony and so on. So here's the question. Uh, what can theoretical computer science contribute to the discussion of consciousness? Uh, I'm hoping a well-defined formal model. I would like to take Barr's model and really make it formal. And we, we are good at de defining things like that, so that we might be able to do that. I would like good definitions of consciousness. What is consciousness? I'd like a good definition. And there are many related things to consciousness, like free will. And I think I'm, I'm happy with uh, the definition of consciousness. I don't know that you will be. I'm happy with our explanation of free will. Uh, I want explanations of how agony and ecstasy might arise in the machine. So, sometimes when I mention this to people that this is what I'm trying to solve, uh, they say, you can't do that. It's impossible. You cannot give a, a solution to that. There are others that are more open to the possibility that one day maybe we'll be able to give an explanation, but certainly we're nowhere near that now. And I'm going to disagree with that. Okay? So, I also want to point out that understanding this difference is really important uh, 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 because I, uh, well, for one thing, I, uh, I would like to be able to understand whether the robot we build really can feel, whether it is conscious or not. We need some understanding. So without such understanding, there's no way to tell if an entity an animal or robot is conscious. I know that you're conscious because I know you're built like I am. And I'm conscious, and so I know you are. But how about a dog? Is a dog conscious? Um, uh, what's her name? Uh, 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 okay, so uh, what's the woman who's, uh, who, who studies cows? Uh, uh, Temple Grandin. Grandin, thank you. <laughs> Temple Grandin. She's sure that cows are conscious. She says animals are conscious down to the point of fish. Fish, she thinks, are not conscious. But you know, octopuses are built very differently from us. Are they conscious? And you know, some, uh, some of these explanations are in term, terms of chemicals like dopamine. But th th those explanations are not going to help when we want to know if the robot is conscious. It's not going to be based on dopamine. Uh, so I want to give you this model of the conscious Turing machine. It's uh, the purpose, by the way, let me, so this is very important. The purpose of the conscious Turing machine is not to compute uncomputable functions. That's not possible, okay? That's not possible. Nor is the purpose of the thing to solve problems more efficiently, which is what we theoretical computer scientists are often interested in. That's not the purpose. The purpose is to suggest possible solutions to the hard problem, to consciousness and to the hard problem. So here's the conscious Turing machine. Uh, you'll see uh, the, the yellow corresponds to what we are conscious of. Uh, up at the top, we are conscious of a very what's going on in a very short-term, short, tiny short-term memory. That short-term memory is the stage, and it has very little in it. There is this paper by George Miller called The Magic Number 7 Plus or Minus 2, which explains why you can remember a phone number that's a seven, maybe nine-digit number at the most, but if somebody gives you a ten-digit number, forget it you will not be able to hold it in your memory long enough to be able to find it. So short-term memory is tiny. Uh, and I'll give you an explanation for why, uh, a, an explanation for why it has to be that. We are conscious of what's there. And the definition of consciousness is what's going on in short-term memory. That is what we are conscious of. 
And uh, that includes, uh, to some extent, what's going on in the input to this machine and to the output to it. Everything down below, unconscious. There's no central executive. So this is one way in which this differs. The central executive, that finite state part, that in this model is simply taken up by one of these processors. There's a processor here that's concerned with just generally, how did we get where we are? And there's another processor concerned with orchestrating what goes on in the stage. But in general, when a, uh, when a processor gets up on the stage, uh, it basically is dealing with what's there, and it is the stage manager while it's up there. And it will be the stage manager until it's overtaken by another processor. So here's the model. The dynamics of it is that you have uh, a very short, tiny short-term memory, and whatever is there is broadcast to all of the unconscious processors at the bottom. You can think of these processors as being CPUs, core processing units. They are CPUs. They have input from above, they have output to above, they have, uh, the, you, there's the ability to interrupt them, they, ha they have that, and they have their own memory. One can go into the, uh, the definition, but this, this is fast broadcast. Whatever's up there, all the processors know about. Going back up, that's harder because uh, different processors have different information to send up. And the question is, what information should actually get sent up? And there has to be some sort of agreement on what will actually go up. And uh, so I have, we have, Lenore and I have decided on this particular uh, way in which it goes up. Uh, first of all, some, let's take this example. Uh, pain has a weight. And the weight of pain, it's negative here. The weight of pain is determined, and at least initially with a young kid, by how many nociceptor fibers are firing and with what frequency. It's what you might expect that determines the weight. But afterwards, the weight can be modified in other ways. So here, you see pain has minus five and joy has plus three. There's, there may, are there fibers for joy? Well, there certainly are neurons in the brain that are firing that sort of how many are firing, how, what frequency determines how much pleasure that, uh, that, that entity is feeling. And the way this is working is pain, the, the absolute value of the weight determines which goes up. Pain has absolute value five, joy has absolute value three, pain goes up. And it goes up with the sum of the two weights. So it's minus five and plus three goes up as minus five plus three minus two. Notice that there are things you can check with this. Uh, th what this is suggesting is that if you have pain and you have pleasure, and they're equal, whatever that means, in strength, they will cancel each other. And this is something that you can check. And it's just wonderful that if, I don't know if you've gone to a dentist and had uh, been given laughing gas. It's a wonderful experience, I can tell you. Yes, yes. And the, the dentist who gives you laughing gas is told you give just enough to cancel the pain. Too little and you have pain. Too much and you start to get uh, manic and he won't be able to deal with you. So you give just enough. It's like there is a weight at which these two cancel each other. And then you don't go up. You can see here pain at minus two and fear at minus five. The, big, the one with greater magnitude goes up, that's fear. And uh, the weight is the sum of the two weights. That's min minus seven. OK, that's the uh, idea. And uh, these uh, weights can be modified. The, the nice thing is that uh, Avram was telling me about how he would make use of these weights to decide w which processors are t telling the truth or how truthful they are. You know, each processor is deciding for itself what weight to give its particular piece of information. And if the weights are appropriate and good, then they will get higher values. And if they're not, the values will, will drop down. So this is very nice. I would love to have a paper with Avram and Lenore, but never have had one. So, OK, so short-term memory. Uh, so I told you short-term memory is what we are conscious of. 
And I'd like to define consciousness as the content of short-term memory. That is what we are conscious of. That is it. We are conscious of what's in short-term memory. And whether you believe we can understand this or not, it's worthwhile actually thinking about it this way and beginning to see how this actually plays out, that yes, in fact, that is what we are conscious of. There's some funny things like, I seem to be conscious of everything that's in this room, but I'm not really. I'm only conscious of a little bit here and a little bit there. And uh, the rest is just stuff that I can be conscious of if I point, pay attention to it. So what is consciousness? It's what we are aware of while we are awake or while we're dreaming, okay? There's another thing that we're conscious of, which is inner speech. It's very important. We all have inner speech. We talk to ourselves. I've spoken to deaf people, and they talk to themselves in their hand language, but they talk to themselves. And uh, it's what we are aware of and inner speech. So why is this definition of consciousness reasonable? So the explanation is, so again, we come back to the fact that I'm saying that whatever is in short-term memory is broadcast to every single processor, every single unconscious processor. Every processor in the brain is aware of what's going on there. The explanation for why this is reasonable is that if there is even if our consciousness is due to one processor alone, that processor knows what's going on up there. And it's probably not due to that. It can be due to this whole combination. Every processor knows what's going on. Why is short-term memory so tiny? So this is a question that keeps on coming up. And there's a nice explanation here, which is that you want all of these processors to be paying attention to the same thing. And if you have a very large short-term memory, they cannot be paying attention to the same thing. One will pay attention to this, one will pay attention to that. If you have very little, each processor is paying attention to the same thing. And then there's the question of what is a chunk. Uh, did I mention, so a chunk came up in this uh, paper, 1965, George Miller, uh, uh, the magic number seven plus or minus two, which has to do with our seven digit phone numbers. Uh, he, he said what a chunk is, but he didn't really define it. He said a chunk is a digit or a letter or a word. And even if you've memorized a poem, it's a poem. So what's a chunk? The nice thing that comes out of this is that a chunk is what's up on the stage. It is a pointer to the processor that is controlling what's going on on the stage. It is a pointer. That's what a chunk is, and that's, that pointer can be pointing to a, the alphabet, in which case you're thinking about the alphabet, probably the very beginning of it. Moni, you look a little puzzled. But that's okay, you have a right to be puzzled a lot. <laughs> okay, so uh, the conscious, this is a very beautiful example of how the whole thing works, but I don't have the time. Free will. So, Free will is a beautiful thing that we can't explain here. Uh, Paul Carew said that free will is the ability to choose between different possible courses of action unimpeded. And our definition is very much like that. It's the ability to compute the consequences of different courses of action and choose accordingly, according to some measure, whichever consequence you feel is right. So. Let me give you as an example the case of chess. Here, uh, you're, you're, you're black, it's your turn to move. What move should you make? And uh, you have free will as long as you don't yet know which is the best choice. You, there are several possible moves you could make at this point, and you don't really know which move to make until you try to see the consequence of this move and that move and such and such move, and when you have calculated the, the, the consequences as far as you can have, then you lose the free will over that particular move. You make that move. But the point is that computation is not instantaneous, and while you are doing that computing, you are free to choose. The, this problem of free will, so let me just mention, is an old one. 
This is an amazing quote from Lucretius. That's 2,000 year, years ago. This is way before Newton. And he's saying, if all movement is always interconnected, the new arising from the old in a determinate order, if the atoms never swerve so as to originate some new movement that will snap the bonds of fate, the everlasting sequence of cause and effect, what is the source of the free will possessed by living things throughout the earth? This is fantastic. This is way before Galileo. I forget Newton, Galileo, this. And yet, look how very modern uh, this is and the question. He's puzzled by that. Here's Samuel Johnson, who lived around the time of Newton. And this is beautiful. All theory, namely Newton's physics, is against the freedom of the will. All experience is for it. It's a paradox. How to explain that paradox? And so here's an explanation along the same lines I gave you. This one by a very fine uh, cognitive neuroscientist, Dan Dehaney. He says, our brain states are clearly not uncaused and do not escape the laws of physics. Nothing does. But our decisions are genuinely free whenever they are based on a conscious deliberation carefully weighing the pros and cons before committing to a course of action. And when this occurs, we're correct in speaking of a voluntary decision. Okay, that's, I like that solution, that's free will. This is the last slide. Okay, it's the hard problem. It's also the hardest one. So I'd like to end this with a, 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 the hard problem, the feeling of pain, the agony of pain. Lenore would prefer that I speak to you about the, the, the ecstasy, the joy of ecstasy. She's, that was, but actually, that's much harder to explain. The explanation for joy is very different from the explanation for pain. So, and pain is very fundamental, and uh, we, we all know what pain is. So, uh, also, uh, okay, so. So how might the conscious Turing machine experience pain? So I'm going to give you two suggestions for extreme pain. And uh, there's, I, there's no way you're going to accept this uh, unless you really think, think long and hard. We had many different notion, explanations for pain. Like, for example, if, uh, if you hear yourself cry out, that's painful. You learn, what this, you learn to feel the pain when you hear yourself cry out. But the case of pain asymbolia shows that that's not true. They're pain asymbolia too. They feel the pain, they cry out, but they don't feel the agony at all. So there are many such suggestions. Here are the two that we've come up with. Extreme pain is an actor that takes over all short-term memory. It prevents all other actors from reaching short-term memory. I'm talking about extreme pain. Uh, you know, if it's not extreme, then there's something like this involved, but extreme pain is where, wow, you can't think about anything else. Nothing else can come up, on, uh, can come up into short-term memory. And uh, there are confirmations of this. That is that when a person really feels very strong pain, he can't do other things. The pain as symbolic pa person, when he feels pain, can still play a good game of chess. It doesn't make the game of chess harder for the, that person plays as good as any. You cannot. You cannot when you are under extreme pain. And I call this a confirmation because, in part, because look, this is such bad design. It's bad design because uh, how could, you know, so non-Darwinian, just when you have the worst of all possible pains, you want to be able to think. That's when you should be able to think, and if it's extreme pain, you cannot. It's that inability to think that's causing the, the pain. And there's another kind of pain that comes up, which is, you know, when you, when, if, I don't know if you've ever torn a ligament. This is a really terrible pain, I mean, tearing a ligament. People are known to throw up when they tear, it's, it's, it's just awful. Uh, how to explain that? 
the, ex the explanation is that when you have this extreme pain, that shock is an actual interrupt of all of the processors down at the bottom. So those processors at the bottom are getting input from the outside world, from above, but the, uh, the, the, the interrupt is different from the input from above. The interrupt is basically telling each of the processors, whatever you're doing, put it on hold and pay attention to this. And it's that interrupt that causes that shock uh, the moment you have the pain. I'm sure I don't have all the answers, but these are two of the possible answers. And uh, uh, be nice to go on to joy, but that's the end of this. Uh, this is a very short talk, but uh, I, if you like to hear two, there are uh, many more slides at this location, and there's a YouTube video of a longer talk at this location. And I think we have enough time for a question. For sure. Yeah. And you see this was pain asymbolia. There, there, uh, there's um, children that are born with pain asymbolia rarely live past the age of three. That's it. They don't live because they damage themselves. And uh, there was a, 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 a girl, the parents really wanted her to live. She was a beautiful baby. Uh, by the age of five, the, you see her, she's not so beautiful anymore. The parents had to remove all her teeth because she was biting her lips and her tongue. And then she was out playing and she broke her leg. And by that time she knew, she'd been told, when you feel the pain, because she knew about the pain, when you feel the pain of, uh, of, of something broken, you stop. But she was out playing ball and she was having fun. And now when you see her, picture, you can see one leg is shorter than the other. Yes, yes. Yes, that's why I mentioned Avram's work where he's telling us basically how these weights should be adjusted as you go up. Yes, that's important. Oh, I guess, I guess. <laughs> so this is such a wonderful audience because you're, you're the ones that will be able to answer how to make use of that machine learning here. Uh, just what we said here. When, uh, when, when, when the ro uh, I would first of all build the robot with this architecture, and the architecture would be such that when something like pain is up on the stage, severe pain, you cannot think about anything else. Fr freedom is such a wonderful thing. The reason for the pain is that you are no longer free to think about what you want. That's painful. There are all of these processors wanting to get up there. You cannot get them up there because the pain is not allowing them up. Um, Umesh. Well, it's, it's, those are the seven processors. See, that's seven plus or minus two processors. The chunks, the actors are pointers to processors that are up on the stage. 
And those processors, one of them could be this fusiform face area that recognizes faces and, and maybe the name attaches names to faces. This, this uh, I don't know if that explains, but the, the point is, it's interesting, isn't it, that uh, you, if you try to imagine um, something that you know well, like your, your home, what your room looks like at home, you can imagine it, but it's not really the same as looking at it. But nevertheless, the information in your brain is pretty good, and if you have a dream, especially one of these dreams, lucid dreams, where you really know you're dreaming, you can see that your brain really has a very good picture of what's going on there. And I think that picture is a very short description of that room. And any part of it, you can go to it. So uh, I have okay. a comment that, that relates to something you said about mammals versus fish. One way to measure consciousness might be looking at the variety of different personalities different species have. So I do believe that mammals like dogs have very distinct personalities, but when you get down to maybe ants, maybe the personalities, either we don't observe them, but they may be less different, which might relate to some of the observations we made about different species. Yeah, so, uh, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Oh, let me ask a question, right? Yeah, so, uh, suppose we've like got this quantum string of things and stuff that we can, so now we can say, like, absolutely clear and stuff. Suppose I get a good old string machine that accepts the fact Suppose you get a what kind of string machine? What? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. So I'm suggesting that without this architecture, you don't have consciousness. Uh, I could be wrong. There may be other architectures. The octopus is a very strange architecture, but uh, I, I don't think you, you can talk about consciousness in the case of a small Turing machine. Tononi would disagree with me. There are, so, Tononi thinks that a thermostat is conscious, small amount of consciousness. But. What it's doing differently is that you have all of these processors yeah. seeing what's going on and the same, paying attention to the very same thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I Ryan, I, my answer is I don't think consciousness is hard to come by. I think very low animals are, are, are conscious. I, you know, I've become a vegetarian since I learned about this. Very low animals can be conscious. There is even a paper by a guy named Bjorn Merker uh, uh, who, who points out that uh, there are people who have no cortex. They're born with water in their head, no cortex, and yet they are conscious. You don't even need a cortex to be conscious. It's a very simple thing, and I'm claiming it's this architecture that does it. Um, maybe I don't know. You might wonder where, where, which part of the brain is, is this, where's the stage, for example? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, well, it's not doing anything that a Turing machine can't do. It's just it's doing it in a different way. Okay, we're going to...